Is it the story of the soldier and the hunchback? The connection between the worlds of intelligence and the occult should go without saying, but there are many things to say. In England, it's a very well-established fact, dating back to Elizabeth I and her court astrologer, Dr. John Dee, the original 007 who coined the term the British Empire. It is equally well-established that Aleister Crowley worked for British intelligence. Although his intelligence role is thought to be much more modest and peripheral than Dr. D's, it is generally accepted as plausible, sometimes presented as established fact, that Crowley had enough influence to have his proposed anti-swastika power symbol, the V for victory, adopted by Churchill himself. Crowley's connections were to naval intelligence, and Churchill was the first Lord of the Admiralty during World War I, so he would have been Crowley's direct superior when Crowley was loudly pretending to be anti-British in New York. In the States, the Office of Naval Intelligence is associated with the fake counterculture of the Laurel Canyon scene, which is also associated with the V sign. Hmm. So... It's accepted that there were very few degrees of separation between these luminaries, but no suggestion of a meeting, which is a bit surprising since they had rather a lot in common. Churchill is also known as a drug addict, for one thing. He was a Freemason, naturally, but had you heard that Churchill was initiated as a druid? Did you know he had a reputation for being psychic? His intuition supposedly saved his own life or the lives of others on three separate occasions. So, Churchill was rocking some unexpectedly Crowleyan attributes. And meanwhile, Crowley told a friend he felt responsible for the sinking of the Lusitania. He was working his occult context to persuade the Germans to be belligerent, while Churchill took more concrete steps to make such an accidental drowning of neutral passengers much more likely, as part of their shared mission to embroil America in Europe's Great War. Their efforts appear to have paid off, but Crowley's influence on the course of the war may go further than that. He is said to have led a divination ritual in 1910, at the request of another admiralty agent, Commander Marston, which predicted that wars with Germany and Turkey would begin within five years, and that both of those countries would be destroyed. Turned out to be pretty accurate. In the novel Moonchild, Crowley's avatar Simon If dismisses everyone who thinks they know why World War I started and says it was, quote, I who made it, explaining that it is a necessary catalyst for the emergence of the new aeon. Even more relevant are Crowley's short stories featuring Simon If, as a sleuth who not only solves crimes, but sometimes colludes with journalists and law enforcement to cover up the truth, promising, I will arrange with the consulate for secrecy, he concludes another case by musing that they should install the murderer as Minister for Education. It's implied he could perhaps actually arrange for this as a revered senior member of the local elite secret society, the Hemlock Club. Elsewhere, Simon If has enough pull with the Admiralty to borrow a top-secret advanced vehicle just so he can create a puzzle for his friend. In short, Simon If has the sensibility of Crowley and the connections of Churchill. The suspicious accuracy of Crowley's World War I prediction is nothing compared to a Simon If tale of high political intrigue titled A Sense of Incongruity, which features a plot against America by what was, at the end of World War I, when the story was written, a very unlikely alliance of Austria and Japan, which turned out to be a big bullseye, Hitler being from Austria. But what if I told you this story ends after Dr. Nagasaki is destroyed by a new and, quote, intensely radioactive weapon? Which is, of course, precisely what happens on the last page of World War II. Five years is one thing. 20 to 25 years ahead of time is quite another. Just how psychic was this guy supposed to be? Or, if the script for the next war was set that far in advance... Why would a supposedly lowly agent like Crowley know all about it? The editor, William Breeze, is startled, obviously, and describes Crowley as, quote, eerily prescient. Just really another way of saying coincidence theory. Could there be a more direct connection here? Mr. Breeze also says it should awaken the sense of incongruity in any attentive reader, which is curious since, in the story, Simon If initially exposes the plot 
by noticing a telltale facial feature, quote, that only grows on one family face on the planet, end quote. Thus, recognizing a famous European aristocrat who's slumming it undercover in New York on a secret mission to start a war. Simoniff's sense of incongruity is awakened by facial recognition. Naturally, Simoniff prefers his heroic role to remain secret, asking, do you want me pilloried as a meddlesome Matty in the next number of life? Interesting, since meddlesome Matty was the phrase Teddy Roosevelt used to refer to the U.S. getting involved in foreign conflicts, which is exactly the mission Crowley had been secretly working to accomplish in New York. So he was writing about his own intelligence work. The question is, was he also an aristocrat in disguise? Relevant to this question is one of the non-Simoniff stories, titled Colonel Pacton's Brother. It features a group of spiritualist grifters attempting to con the visiting Earl of Granchester, a character who is said to be based on Everard Fielding, an investigator of seances and trance mediums, who was also the man who recruited Crowley for secret work in 1914, according to Richard Spence. Their plan, the grifters, is foiled when it turns out that they were talking to someone else all along, a character said to be based on Crowley, who was posing as the aristocrat. One conspirator reproaches the other that they did every kind of detailed research about their mark, but never bothered to look at his picture. Ask yourself, have you done every kind of detailed research about these people except for looking at their pictures? Is that something people can be counted on to miss? As Crowley wrote elsewhere, investigation of spiritualism makes a capital training ground for Secret Service work. One soon gets up to all the tricks. There's much more of interest in Crowley's short fiction, but for now, I'll just note that one of the centerpiece myth arc episodes of the Simon If in America collection, the Pasquani puzzle, is about a doppelganger. This book is about a celebrity traveling undercover, who also has a doppelganger, but it was written by a different Winston Churchill. So, never mind. The respectable journalism about Crowley's intelligence career tends to conclude that his claimed involvements were not only plausible, but understated. The question being, how much? It is, of course, easy and reasonable to assume that Simon If represents Crowley indulging his fantasy superego rather than venting his true autobiography in fictionalized form. But what if he was zero degrees of separation from power? What would Prime Minister Alistair Crowley do? Well, one of Churchill's signal accomplishments as peacetime Prime Minister was the repeal of the Witchcraft Act, which had existed in various forms since the days of Elizabeth and John Dee and was used during the war to jail a medium who had channeled classified information. Churchill expressed outrage, and within a few years of the war's end, the various forms of magic were fully legalized. Mission accomplished? Whose mission? So, on the one hand, the notorious drug-fiend spy writer who was king of the magicians and precisely predicted both world wars... And on the other hand, the psychic druid drug addict who was king of the spies and who was a primary showrunner for both world wars. And they were the same age, born within a year of each other. And, oh yeah, last but certainly not least, Crowley liked to dress up as Churchill. So much so that this photo exists. I mean, sure, everyone likes to make fun of their boss, but... There are no candid photos of Aleister Crowley until he was an old man. All his other pictures are very posed. Even the goofy ones are, have the intensity of yoga postures. He must have really resonated with the tribal icon of the British Bulldog. Is it the story of the soldier and the hunchback? Is it the mystery of charisma? Is it manufacturing charisma? Or is it the story of the eagle with two heads? An exoteric sun head and an esoteric moon head? This is a prominent symbol of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, the school that Aleister Crowley cut his magical teeth in. But they didn't invent the two-headed eagle. That's a very old symbol. 
the world's oldest symbol, according to Google. But the Golden Dawn incorporate the alchemical sun and moon. Two heads, two faces, a controlled opposition, playing both sides. Churchill, ruler of the day world of parliament and a captain of recorded history. And Crowley, lord of the dark rivers, master of the colonial subconscious, synthesizing sorcerous traditions from every corner of the empire. It's just that on top of all of this, these two really look alike. This resemblance is remarkable on its own. A remarkable coincidence, if that's what it is, and how much more of a coincidence that they are the same age and everything else. If this is a coincidence, it is analogous to the great coincidence of the apparently identical size of the sun and the moon. If this is a coincidence, consider it an eclipse.